آل محمد especially the brothers by the door if you can move forward and mashallah al fatiha صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة ما خاب والله من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيمة قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما كان المؤمنين المؤمنون لينفروا كافة فلولا نفر من كل فرقة منهم طائفة يتفقه في الدين ولينذروا قومهم إذا رجعوا إليهم لعلهم يحذرون so in your gathering with the remembrance upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. As a gift to the soul of Sayyidi wa Mawlai Abu Abdullah al Hussein, recite the second salawat. <laughs> to hasten the reappearance of Sayyidina wa Mawlana Sahib al Asri wa Zaman, recite the third salawat with the loudest of your voices. In the past decade, the Muslim community in America has faced many obstacles and difficulties. Amongst the obstacles and difficulties that we faced was, for example, the burning of the Qur'an by Pastor Terry Jones of the Dove Outreach Center based in Florida. Amongst the challenges that we faced was the discussion in regards to the Sharia law and how for a very long time the media used the discussion in regards to the Sharia law as a tool to belittle the religion of Islam 
or to attack the religion of Islam or to defame the religion of Islam. And amongst the most recent of challenges that we have witnessed is the release of this movie that portrays the Prophet ﷺ in a demeaning manner. However, all those challenges are foreign challenges. Meaning those challenges come to us from outside the Muslim Ummah. However, the American Muslims in America also suffer from obstacles within. And we also face different challenges within. And amongst the primary of the challenges and the most difficult of our challenges, if not the most difficult of our challenges, is the absence of American Muslim Imams within our communities. Imams that have spent their childhood, by Imams I mean spiritual leaders. Imams that have spent their childhood in this country. Imams that have spent their teens in this country. Imams that can relate to the children in our community. Imams that can relate to the teen in our community. And imams who can relate to an average Joe within the American society. Spiritual leaders that understand the American culture and how an average American thinks are absent within our community today. Recent numbers indicate that there are 12 million Muslims in America. Now if this number is true, the number of Muslims in America is double the number of Muslims in Jordan. And it is triple the number of Muslims in Lebanon. And it is four times the number of Muslims in Kuwait. And it is five times the number of Muslims in Qatar. Now imagine how many scholars there are in Jordan. How many scholars there are in Lebanon. How many scholars there are in Qatar. How many scholars there are in, for example, Syria. We are in need of the same ratio in this country as well. To lead and to serve the American Muslim community. While there are 6 million Jews in America, numbers indicate there are 500,000 American Jewish rabbis serving the Jewish community. And while there are 12 million Muslims in America, numbers show that there are approximately 1,200 imams. 1,200 imams serving 12 million Muslims. And rest assured, half of those imams cannot communicate in the English language. So they cannot give a sermon in English. So we're left with 600. 600 of those imams physically, they live in America. They pay taxes. They take their kids to school. They speak English. But physically they live here. And mentally they live where? Pakistan, India, Yemen, Libya, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon. So we're left with 300. Out of those 300, half of them have not had the proper Islamic education. What do I mean? As in there are doctors in the community. If a person has a passion to become a physician and he reads a couple of books about medicine, he doesn't become a doctor, right? If people have a passion for law and they read a couple of books about law and they're inspired about law, they don't become attorneys. Similarly, if you'd like to become an engineer, you have to go to school. If you like to become a teacher, you have to go to school. 
There are many who are inspired by Islam. They're educated Islamically and there's nothing wrong with that. That's very beautiful to know about our religion. But they cannot be the authority when it comes to religion. So if we divide that by half, we're left with 150. Take one fourth of that, about 18 or 17 of them belong, would belong, according to the ratio, would belong to the Shia school of thought. So 2.5 to 3 million followers of Ahl al-Bayt in this country are served by approximately 18 to 19 individuals who physically, spiritually, mentally live in this country, are educated and can serve the community. And I'm not undermining anyone. However, brothers and sisters, the month of Muharram, and I said this, mashallah, in this community, everybody's in the sign business, huh? I said, we have to make, we have to write the mission statement of Imam Hussein, and we put it in the entrance of the house of Imam Hussein. And the institutions that remind us of Imam Hussein, especially in the 10 days of Muharram. So we come in and we see the mission statement of Imam Hussein. What is his mission statement? Let's not deviate from the mission statement. Let's not forget the mission statement. Let us not spend so much time about things that are irrelevant to the mission statement of Imam Hussein. What is his mission statement? أَنِّي لَمْ أَخْرُجْ أَشْرًا وَلَا بَطِرًا وَلَا مُفْسِدًا بَلْ خَرَجْتُ لِإِصْلَاحِ أُمَّةِ جَدِّي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ لِكَيْ آمُرَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَأَنْهَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأَسِيرُ عَلَى سِيرَةِ جَدِّي وَأَبِي عَلِيُّ بْنُ أَبِي طَالِبِ I have not gone out but for the following reasons. When he was leaving Medina, they came to him, they said, Yabna Rasulullah, what's going on? Why are you leaving? Don't you know the people of Iraq? He said, yes, I know. But I am leaving for the following reasons. I am leaving for no other reasons but the following. This is what he said. What is it? Not fame, not popularity, he states. Not position, not khilafah. Hussein knows. He will not read such things. But to perfect the ummah of my grandfather Rasulullah. Let me ask you, the ummah, the Muslim ummah today in America, is it in that perfect state? Let's ask a simple question. Pew is a research center based in the United States of America. You can all go and... And, and look at the numbers and polls that they released in regards to Islam and Muslims in the year 2010. They suggest that 52% of Americans oppose the building of a mosque near ground zero. 52%. 39% of Americans would not be comfortable if they had a Muslim neighbor. 30% of Americans would not feel comfortable and they would be nervous if there was a Muslim man on their flight. 18% of Americans would feel nervous if there was a Muslim woman on their flight. 54% of Americans believe Islam is more likely to teach violence than any other faith. Is this a perfect state? Look at the state of the Ummah in the Middle East, besides the wars and the bloodshed and everything else. Look at the ratio of literacy versus the ratio of illiteracy. For those who don't know, let me share with you. And the cradle of Islam, and the sanctuary of Islam, and the birthplace of Islam, where Allah sent the first revelation to Rasulullah, stating what? Stating pray, fast, do hajj? No. Iqra. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Khalaq al-insana min alaq. Iqra wa rabbuka al-akram alladhi allama bil-qalam. Allama al-insana. Allama al-insana ma lam ya'lam. The first revelation is to teach, to learn. Yet, 60% of the population of Saudi Arabia is literate. The rest are illiterate. The rest are illiterate. The ratio of literacy to illiteracy, and for example, Pakistan, is 70 to 30. 
In Yemen, it's 65. Literacy rate is at 65%. In Egypt, it's at 70%. 30% of the people do not know how to read and write. In Libya, it's also 68%, almost 70%. 30% of the people cannot read and write. And of course, if you don't read and write, many people who are illiterate, they can't get jobs. Or if they get jobs, they're not going to be the best of jobs. So if they're not going to be the best of jobs, in the end of the day, they still have to bring bread and put it on the table. They still have to pay rent. They still have to pay tuition for their children's schools. They still have to buy clothes. They still... All the spending is there. Lack of jobs. The economy is in a terrible state. And hence you see the violence, the bloodshed. The lack of basic needs and basic goods. This is the state of the ummah. The least we can do here as American Muslims is to try to change what is happening in the country that we live in. Change our status. Change the way we live today. And many people say, well, why does this relate to me? What does this have to do with me? I tell you, that's, Imam Hussein could have easily said that and stayed in Medina. He could have said, I didn't put Yazid in power. Other people did. From the day of Saqifa, Yazid was created. So Imam, Imam Hussein could have said, I didn't, I was in the cause. And I'm sitting here in Medina carrying out my activities. And Imam Hussein was very busy, many people. They don't know Imam Hussein and they're not aware of Imam Hussein's acts before he left Medina. When Muawiyah appointed his son Yazid, before he appointed his son Yazid, he had an advisor. He had a Christian advisor who told him, you think, Muawiyah, if your father Abu Sufyan was present, he would let you give the Khilafah to Hassan and Hussein? So he said to him, no, I don't think my father would. But what am I going to do with Hussein? I've already wrote a, a treaty with Hassan. I have to give the Khilafah to Hussein. What am I going to do with Hussein? I can take care of all the rest of those guys. But Hussein, I won't be able to put my son Yazid as a Khalifa. And Hussein won't accept. So he said to him, this Hussein that you talk about, Hussein ibn Ali, who is he? He said to him, if you like to meet Hussein, go to Medina. Enter the Masjid of Rasulullah. And take a right. When you take a right, you'll see a man sitting on the mimbar. And he's speaking. He's speaking eloquently. And he speaks to them of the hadith of the hadith of his grandfather and his father. And the people sitting do not blink an eye. They give him his un, they give him their undivided attention. Daka Hussein ibn Ali. That is Hussein ibn Ali. That is the influence of Hussein ibn Ali. What am I going to do with him? So Imam Hussein, he was busy. He was already executing his Islamic duties. But Imam Hussein chose to perfect the Ummah. And today, if we want to perfect our societies. And if we want to protect our community and our ummah, we need those who represent. First of all, bring us the knowledge of the Qur'an, the knowledge of the hadith, the knowledge within history, the knowledge within, for example, the Islamic philosophy, the knowledge of ilm al-kalam. We need those individuals to come and bring us the basic and after basic, the in-depth knowledge in regards to Islam, the ulama and the scholars. And that is why I have chosen to speak about this notion tonight. And examine chapter 9 verse 122, an extremely important verse. Allah in this verse says, مَا كَانَ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ لِيَنْفِرُوا كَافَةً All the believers would not be able to travel. فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِنْ كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ مِنْهُمْ طَائِفَةٍ 
لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ From every community there shall be individuals who travel and take the fiqh of deen. Meaning what? Learn the Islamic sciences. لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ وَلِيُنذِرُوا قَوْمَهُمْ إِذَا رَجَعُوا إِلَيْهِمْ And return to their communities and share that Islamic knowledge with them. Many people probably didn't know this verse existed in the Qur'an. Alhamdulillah, now we know. We'll examine this verse in the following manner. Number one, why was this verse revealed? Number two, after we speak of the reason why this verse was revealed, we'll speak of the notion within the Holy Qur'an and within this ayah that the representative must be part of the community. Number three, we'll examine the fiqh in regards to this ayah, the Islamic jurisprudence in regards to the ayah. And number four, we'll examine how the ayah divides the community into two main categories. That if they were to work together, they will be able to conquer the highest mountains of success and perfection. And last but not least, we will examine the different forms of travel within the Islamic ideology. Why was this verse sent down? Nine, verse chapter 9, verse 121. Scholars have given, given three opinions. First opinion, they say that Rasulullah would carry, out, would carry on his activities every day, meaning he would give hadith, he would give the tafsir of the Qur'an, the Qur'an would be revealed. Rasulullah would say why this is revealed, where it was revealed. While people were traveling, while people were at war, while people were preparing for battles, for example, so they couldn't be present there. They couldn't write the hadith. They all couldn't hear Rasulullah all the time and sit next to him. So this ayah came to solve this particular problem that not all of you need to be present there. Some of you can be present. And they take the information and they reflect that information onto others. The second reason that the ulama have stated on asbab al-nuzul of this particular ayah is that some people when they became Muslim for example, such as Abu Dhar, when he became Muslim, he would return to his people, he would spend some time, three months, six months, a year with his people, to convert his tribe, to convert his village, to convert his people. He would teach them salah, he would teach them fasting, he would teach them the basic principles about Islam. When he would return, they would tell him, Louis, you don't know what you missed out. Quran was being revealed, hadith was being given, so your knowledge now is a lot less than what, you, what it could have been if you would have stayed here. So people were being discouraged. They become Muslim. Rasulullah says to them, go and try to speak to your village. Go and try to speak to your family. Go and try to speak to your tribe. No, Ya Rasulullah, we're going to stay here. Because if we stay here, we're going to miss out. This ayah came to solve this particular problem that not all of you need to sit with Rasulullah all the time. There shall be a group of people recording the knowledge and passing that knowledge on to others. But the third reason is by far the po most popular opinion in regards to the reason why this verse was revealed. The reason why this verse was revealed according to the Mufassireen is because everyone started migrating to Medina. When Rasulullah came to Medina, people from Mecca, people from different parts of the Islamic world, especially the surrounding cities and villages came to Medina. So they left their villages. The Muslims, they left their villages, left their hometowns. They came, they sat in Medina. Why are you here? We have to learn from Rasulullah. We have to see Rasulullah, hear the Quran. How else would we hear? How else would we read? And the societies began to suffer. Because for example, every society needs physicians, every society needs teachers, Every society needs, for example, farmers. Every society needs different individuals that make up the society. Now if the majority of them leave and come to Medina, that society is going to suffer. 
the ayah was revealed stating, listen, not every one of you should come to Medina. From every small village, from every small community, from every town, from every tribe, send several people to Rasulullah. Let them receive the fiqh. Here the fiqh means what? All Islamic sciences. Let them learn of their deen, their faith, their religious affairs, and then come back and share that knowledge with you. This is the reason why this verse was sent down. Now the verse also speaks of a notion that the person has to be one of the community, not an import from outside. And this notion is also embedded within the Holy Qur'an. Look at, for example, how Allah refers to the Prophet Nuh, uh, the Prophet Hud. Hud, his community didn't believe in him. They were punished. But yet Allah refers to him as Akhahum Huda, their brother Hud. Meaning, he was a brother to them. He was one of them, spoke like them, acted like them, lived like them, can relate to them, can understand them, understands their culture, understands their language. He's one of them. He's not a foreign to them. Akhahum huda. Another statement Allah in the Quran, Holy Quran says, Akhahum Salih, the brother Salih. Salih has people, one of them, not even one believed in him. But yet Allah says, the brother Salih, because he acted like a brother to them. He was one of them. He was not seen as a foreigner to them. And Allah, when referring to the Arabs, speaking to the Arabs within the Holy Qur'an, He says, Rasulan minkum. I have chosen a prophet from amongst you, one of you, to come and share the knowledge with you, to be a prophet amongst you, not somebody foreign to you. Why? Why the, the need for us to have a member from our community, not an import? It's very... Obvious that at times people from other communities and other societies would not be able to relate to our society and our communities. They would not be able to speak of our needs. They will not be able to specially relate with the youth. They will not be able to relate with children and teenagers growing up in this country. And this is a fact that we have been keeping aside for a long time. Many people say, Sayyid, what motivated you to go to the Hawza? What motivated me is that absence of Imams that intrigued me. I'm being honest. When I, speak, when I sit and I hear and I give an hour or two of my time and go home, I'd like to see change in my day-to-day life. I'd like to take something back with me. I remember I was in a, a state two years ago and the season of I, I can't say because you'll know. And I was there. So the youth, as soon as I arrived, calling and we want to see you. And I ended up spending every day while I was there in counseling, marriage counseling, pre-marriage counseling, divorce counseling of young adults, of people my age. And I remember I came across a couple. They came and they sat and they spoke to me. And when they were leaving... This gentleman's wife told me, Sayyid, really, thank you. I wasn't going to come because my last experience was horrible. I said, how come? She said that when we went to another imam, as soon as I arrived, he said, I can't bring you into my house. I can't bring you, for example, into the office. I don't remember whether it was the office or the house. Fix your hijab. You're wearing makeup. You have to change all of this and then you come to marriage counseling. But today you didn't do this with me. You see, with the youth at the door, if you send them back, they're not going to come back. They're not going to return. A wise thing would be to speak to them, to solve their marital problem, to bring them together, to give them happiness, then they'll come. When they come, you can speak about, you can speak about hijab, you can speak about salah, you can speak about siyam. And sometimes... Yes, we'll bring speakers that can relate to the whole community in the month of Muharram, in the month of Safar, in the month of Ramadan. But that is not enough for the whole community is in need of a spiritual leader all the time. 
The community and the youth of the community especially are in need of a spiritual guide at all the times. Somebody they can relate to, somebody they can speak to. I myself, for example, would be afraid if I went to my father, who is also an imam, and he is my father, to tell him about, for example, some of my difficulties at high school or college. Because we're always concerned that we will be judged by those who didn't experience this. They were in my shoes, how would they know? Therefore Allah and the Holy Qur'an speaks of the notion that this representative has to be part of the community, has to be a brother, has to be someone that can relate to every aspect of my life. A person that will not judge me, a person who will accept me, a person who will hear my problems, whether they're in regards to drugs, whether they're in regards to alcohol, whether they're in regards to parties, whether they're in regards to having doubts about my religion. Don't tell me this is not part of the community. Don't tell me not. Say it. This is the wrong community. Nobody here has doubts. Here, nobody, alhamdulillah, all our kids. No, this is something. Unfortunately, the Western culture has not just struck. Well, we live in the West. So we're influenced at first hand. But the Western culture is no longer, it no longer belongs in the West. It belongs to the whole world now. It's an imported culture that exists everywhere. So this is the second notion. And the third notion within the ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks of the wajib and the fiqh and the Islamic laws in regards to this particular notion. What do I mean? The scholars have divided wajib into two categories. First type of wajib is known as wajib al-ayni. What is wajib al-ayni? Wajib al-ayni is mandatory acts and there is no way around it. <coughs> prayers is a mandatory act. There is no way around prayers. If I'm alive, I have to pray. I can't hire someone to do my prayers. I can't pay someone to do my prayers. Prayers, I have to do myself. Fasting, if the month of Ramadan comes, I am not ill, or there isn't an Islamic reason for me not to fast, I have to observe fast. I can't say, well, I'm going to hire somebody to fast for me. No, that's wajib ayni. Hajj is also wajib ayni. My khums, I have to pay it myself. It's wajib ayni. Those are wajib ayni. They're wajib that do not change. I have to carry them out myself. The other wajib is called wajib. Who can tell me? Huh? Kifai, Masha. Who said kifai? Ahsan. Make a salawat for this brother. And a second salawat for me. And a third salawat for yourself. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alimah. The second form of wajib is wajib aini. What is wajib aini? Wajib, wajib kifai. Wajib kifai is when there is a wajib and the wajib is mandatory upon every member in the community. For example, if there is a death incident, it is wajib and mandatory upon everyone in the community to what? Wash the body? That's wajib. But if one person does it, then it's no longer wajib upon the others. But if everyone neglects it, it's haram on everyone. Number two, they have to cough in the body, they have to put it in the kefen. If one person does it, then the wajib is removed from everyone. But if, everyone, if no one does it, then the haram falls on everyone's shoulder. And everyone is still liable for, for putting that dead person in the kefen. Same goes for salatul mayyit, praying on the body. It's wajib onto all Muslims to pray on that body, if, but if one person does it, it no longer is wajib. Same goes on the burial. We need to bury that person. If one person buries him, it's enough. So it's called wajib kifai. If one person does it, the rest are no longer liable. But if no one does it, everyone is liable. Go look at all the books of our scholars today. They tell you this ayah speaks of wajib kifai. It is wajib and mandated. 
for a group or certain individuals, whatever, whatever is needed, individuals to seek this route of seeking knowledge, or else everyone is liable for this wajib. It's called wajib kifai. Now while we understand that this is a wajib kifai, let us come to the next notion of how Allah divided this divided every community into two parts by this ayah. The first part, or the minority, the very two or three people, maybe more, maybe less, who have gone to seek this knowledge. Right? This is one part. The second part is everyone else. The teacher, the lawyer, the doctor, the businessman, the merchant, the professor, everyone else that carry the financial burden. Hand in hand, those two will make a prosperous community. A community that can conquer success, that can conquer the highest mountains of perfection. Let's start with the responsibility of the minority, who are the ulama, the spiritual leaders, the guides. What should motivate me to go, for example, to the city of Najaf? What should be my incentive to, for example, study the religion of Islam? What should be my incentive to go to Qum or to go to Karbala? My incentive should be to become an individual that if when people see me and they look at me and they observe me, I remind them of Allah. And when they speak to me, they gain Islamic knowledge from me. And when they observe me and observe my behavior, they are reminded of the day of judgment. That is the criteria of a alim according to Rasulullah and Ahlul Bayt. My reason should not to become a celebrity and a superstar. My reason should not be for fame and popularity, but my, fame, my aim should be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the first rule. Second, there will be difficulty. There will be difficulty. My grandfather narrates that he went in the presence of a alim, a marja, a grand marja of our time. Maybe I shouldn't mention his name. And he said, I saw a black ball in front of him. So I said to him, what is this black ball? He said, this black ball represents the days when I, when I had barely reached the city of Najaf. Nobody knew me. I was by myself. And I was a student. I didn't have anything to eat. The little money that I had, I would buy books. I'd buy, I would go to the hammam, because the hammam was, you had to pay in. People didn't have showers, hammams in their home. So he said, what is the bowl? He said, the bowl, at night, I would walk in some of the Najaf's neighborhoods, and I would find what's in the garbage. Maybe a piece of chicken, maybe some vegetables, maybe a piece of bread. I would come home, I would wash it, I would boil it, and then I would eat it. I didn't have food to eat. This is the number one aim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To truly in the day of judgment say, I dedicated myself to Allah. I dedicated myself to Hussein. I dedicated myself to Ahlul Bayt. And the only, re the only way for us to feel that is if we go and we sit with those ulama and we learn from those ulama and we comprehend the messages of those ulama because those ulama do not just teach me what's in the book. With their practice, by observing them and looking them, I see the book being illustrated and demonstrated. Something you don't feel in a university. Some people say, well, we can do this here and... In New York, I can go and become an alim. I, there's nothing wrong with that. You can learn, and it's something beautiful. And But they say, obviously this is a joke. They say that a maulana, he went to Africa to start a hausa. So he gathered a lot of people, and he said, you have to study now. 
and he left. He went to Najaf or Karbala. A couple of years later, he came. He said, I have to test those guys. They've been studying for three, four years. Let's see what they learned. Maybe, you know, they're ready to go out there. And so he said, let me ask you a basic question. Who was the prophet that spoke to animals? He looked at him. Who's the prophet that spoke to animals? After a long while, one of them raised his hand. He says, I know. He said, who? He said, the prophet Tarazan. So sometimes you have to be at the Hawza. You have to be in that environment, not to only receive the sciences and the knowledge, but to also feel the spiritual essence and presence of the ulama. Another aim of a alim is to, another aim of a alim and a spiritual leader is to serve his community unconditionally. I don't mean become a servant. You know, 24-7. No, unconditionally. Serve the community unconditionally, and I'll tell you how. There was a marja' by the name of Ayatollah Najaf, who lived in Najaf. And he lived in the time while the Iraqi government was drafting people, recruiting people for the army. So, when he came home on the first day, a lady came to him. She said to him, Ayatollah, my son, I have one son. How is he going to be drafted? He's going to go in the army. Who's going to take care of me? My husband's deceased. This is my, hus- this is my son's name. Please go and speak to this guy. He knows you, respects you. Maybe he can let my son go. So he said to her, okay, give me the name. He wore his aba and he went. He told the, the recruiter there. He said to him, please excuse this man from the draft, from the army. So he said, Maulana, nobody's excused. Nobody can get out of this. Everybody has to come. I apologize, but you can go. So he came home. As soon as he came home, an old man came to him. He said, Maulana, I have a son who's running the business. I'm very old. If this son goes, who's going to run the business? We're going to stay without anything. So please, this is his name. Go and speak to this guy. Maybe he can excuse my son. He wore his aba again. And he went, he said, this person, has, he has an old father and this is his name. Maybe you can excuse him from the draft, from the army. He said to him, Sayyid, Maulana, I already told you. There's no exceptions. Why are you coming back? So he went back. Again, he came home. A group of people came. Three, four youth came to him. Sayyid, Maulana, we can't go to the army. This, those people, we don't believe in them. They're not doing the right thing. So please, this is our names. Go get, get us excused. So again he went. The third time, the guy said, Ayatollah, I thought you're a mujtahid. I thought you're... But it seems you're, there's something wrong with you. I told you this is the third time. You can't keep on coming. Nobody's excused. No exceptions. He said to him, Wallah, if people come to me until the morning, I'll return here. He said, why? He said, because there is something I am aware of that you are not aware of. And that is the thawab in the walk that I come from my home to this place. And in solving my people's problems and their concerns. Allah says if you solve one problem or to try to solve one problem of your brother in the dunya, Allah will solve a thousand of our problems in the akhirah. One of them is to grant us paradise. One of them. One of them is paradise. Ayatullah al uzma al-Sheikh al-Ha'iri, who is the founder of the Hawza of Qom, one day was sitting inside his house, very cold day, snowing. He was sleeping. Someone knocked at the door. So the khadim opened the door, the servants opened the door. His name was Ali Agha. He opened the door and he slammed the door. So... The Ayatollah came, he said to him, who was it? Why did you slam the door? He said, Sheikh, it's a crazy lady in the middle of the night. She wants me to go and visit her house. I don't have time, so I told her, come back tomorrow. The Sheikh said, but what was her condition? He said, I don't know. She said she has an ill husband. I don't know. So he said, but Ali Agha, what will we answer Imam Zaman tomorrow? What will we answer Allah? We have to go. So the ayatullah wore his aba, his amama, and he ran out behind the lady. 
He tells her, stop. She's heartbroken. She's running, crying home. So he followed her until the house. He saw an old man. No heat, no power, nothing, no food. Shivering. He's about to die. So suddenly, so he called Ali. He said, go bring him medicine. Go bring him heat. Take care of this man. Then he tells his servant, he says to him, what would, he, what would we have done if this man would have died from the cold weather tonight? Tomorrow Allah on the day of judgment would have held me responsible. Yes, you were the founder of the Hawza, but what happened to this man who died while you were sitting at your, ho- at your home in your comfort? So number one should be for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And more importantly, to serve the community unconditionally, wholeheartedly, with passion, with love. And the second group are who? Are those who carry the financial burden. Those who have to put the efforts to build the mosques, to sustain the masjids, the imam bargas, to print the books. So for example, if there is a need for a radio station, develop one. If there is a need for a satellite station to develop one. Or the rest of society. And hand in hand, this society can become a successful Islamic society. Now many of you are probably wondering, I hope my son isn't listening to this lecture. I don't want him to tell me I want to go to Qum tomorrow. What am I going to tell him? I hope... He's not going to be telling me I want to go to Najaf. It's obvious, why? Because the community at large has also been unjust. As in we haven't done our part. We haven't done our part in choosing the smartest, the brightest, the most eloquent members of our society and telling him, listen, we see leadership skills in you. We want you to go and come back and in this journey we will support you. And when you come back we will support you because we are in need and our community is in need. But for a bright, successful, eloquent young man or young woman today, the first thing they'll ask themselves is, I can get into law school, I graduate, get employed, make two, three hundred thousand dollars a year, live a good life. And I'll donate some of it to the masjid. Why should I bother and go? Imam Hussein, remind yourself of the mission statement of Imam Hussein. Inni lam akhraj ashiran, wala batiran, wala mufsida, bal kharajtu li islahi ummati jaddi. The perfection of the ummah needs initiative. The last but not least of the portion of this ayah speaks of the different forms of travel within the Islamic ideology. The first travel is the travel that the ulama have indicated is haram. Safar al a travel where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is displeased with. A travel when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is disobeyed. And unfortunately, I hear some of the youth, for example, we're going to a vacation to Europe. We're going on a vacation to, for example, Vegas. We're going on a vacation to California. We're going on a vacation to, for example, I don't know where. And there, we're a little free to do whatever we like. Make sure before you travel, brothers and sisters, adults, younger brothers, younger sisters, everyone, before you take such trips, there is an ayah in the Holy Qur'an, keep this ayah everywhere, whether it's on your phone, somewhere. Somewhere you look at this ayah all the time. The ayah says, أَلَمْ يَعْلَمْ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ يَرَى This is enough. Is he not aware that Allah is watching? Allah is here. Allah is also in Vegas. Allah is also in California. Allah is also in Dubai. Allah is also in Africa. Allah is also in Switzerland. Allah is also in Italy. Allah is everywhere. And we cannot escape Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the ulama have stated if we take such trips, the salat is what? Salat musafirun fil ma'siyah. The salat is not broken. The salat remains full as a reminder for this person to escape from such traveling. 
The second form of travel is no, a vacation. For the sake of myself, I want to have a good time. But a vacation that reminds me of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I see the skies, and I see the vast earth, and I see the creation of Allah, and I see the different animals, and I see the fish in the ocean, and I... When I see this, I am reminded of Allah and Allah speaks of such people traveling on earth. And He says those people when they see Allah's beauty, they say, Oh Allah, ma khalaqta hadha batilan. You didn't create all of this for no reason. Ma khalaqta hadha batilan subhanaka faqina adhab nar Oh Allah, give us awareness. Oh Allah, rescue us and refrain us from your punishment. Traveling to them reminds them of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by far the greatest form of travel could also be traveling to gain halal rizq. Business trip, but in order to gain halal rizq. <coughs> Rasulullah says if a man dies in such a trip, he dies as a martyr. Man mata kaddan ala iyalih. Mata shahida, a person who goes out of his way, travels, leave his family, leaves the comfort of his home, in order to gain halal of rizq. Amongst the greatest forms of travel is also travel that is mentioned in this ayah in regards to seeking Islamic knowledge. Looks like my time is getting short, so I will just mention the hadiths. Rasulullah says if a man travels, or a woman obviously, this, this has, when Rasulullah says that when a man, he means man and woman, they travel to seek knowledge, Islamic knowledge for every step they take, every breath they take, the fish in the sea, and the birds in the sky, and the angels in the heaven ask for forgiveness for him. Imagine the value that Allah has given to knowledge and seeking Islamic knowledge. Imagine the value. Imagine this grand position. Rasulullah says an hour of a alim looking into his ilm. An hour. One hour of a alim looking into his ilm is superior than 70 years. Not 70 hours, 70 years of a person standing up for salah in the middle of the night. One hour of a alam looking into his ilm. This is the position that Allah gives to those who seek knowledge. Furthermore, if this person were to die, he would be resurrected in the day of judgment, not only as a shaheed, but amongst the prophets of Bani Israel. Amongst the prophets, he will be resurrected with the prophets with the Anbiya, with the Rasul, chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And indeed, amongst the greatest form of travel is also the travel to seek the inner spirituality. To go to Umrah, to go to the visitation of Imam al-Rada, to go to Hajj. But you know where I'm getting there is nothing equivalent to that visit to Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Allahu Akbar. 1,000 Hajj, 1,000 Umrah. Jihad with Rasulullah. Is this it? No. Imam al Sadiq says whoever visits Hussein has given allegiance on the 15th of Sha'ban, has given allegiance to 1,124,000 1, prophets. Man arada an yusafih ma'a wa arba'a wa ashreen alf nabi fal yazru al Hussein. This is Hussein. Further, Imam al Sadiq states something unreal. He says, Man zara al Hussein kaman zara Allah fi arshah. Whoever visits Hussein, he's visited Allah and his throne. Allah and his throne. The visitation of Hussein, what else does it have? The forgiveness of all of our sins. Some people say we go to Hajj every year because this. 
One visitation of Hussein forgives all the sins. Bring sustenance and rizq and it's one year of protection from illnesses and death. According to Imam al-Sadiq. This is Hussein. This is Hussein ibn Ali. And tonight is the night of crying, Wallah. Why? Because tonight the heart of the beloved of Hussein is weeping. Tonight we remind ourselves of whom? Of Sayyida Zainab Umm al-Masa'ib and her two sons. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the visitation of Sayyida Zainab qariban ajlan insha'Allah. Let us take our hearts, our souls, our minds all together towards that shrine in Damascus, the shrine of Sayyida Zainab, Umm al-Masa'ib, al-Sabirah, Zainab bintu Ali. We say to her, Ya Sayyidatana wa Mawlatana. All of you are aware of the position of Zainab and all of you are aware Sayyida Zainab does not let anyone go without giving their hajat to them. Ya Sayyidatana wa Mawlatana Inna tawajjahna wa istashfa'na wa tawassalna biki ila Allah wa qaddamna ki bayna yaday hajatna all of us who love Zainab, all of us who will cry for Zainab and her tragedy tonight. Ya wajihatan inda Allah. Brothers, Muharram, the first ten nights are already passing. Let us bring the passion of Karbala to this gathering. Ya wajihatan inda Sayyida Zainab Salawatullahi Alayha is known as Ummul Masaib, the mother of all tragedies. Why? Because Zainab was there when the house of Fatima was attacked. Zainab was also there when her mother Fatima to Zahra passed away. Zainab was also there when her father Amir al Mu'mineen was struck by the sword. And Zainab was also there witnessing Al Imam al Hassan's martyrdom. But indeed, the greatest of tragedies of Zainab had remained. Why? Because Fatima to Zahra, Amir al Mu'mineen, had told her Zainab. There will be a day when your brother Hussein will be all by himself in the deserts of Karbala. On that day, Zainab, do not leave your brother Hussein. Imam Hussein, before he marched towards the enemies, he came out and he said, Who is there to give me my horse? And there was no one of the companions to bring the horse, but suddenly he saw his sister Zainab crying, coming out to him, saying, Ara'ayta ukhtan qaddamat l'akhiha faras al-manoon bila kifan wa khalilu. Have you ever seen Hussein, a sister, bring a horse to her brother that will not return him? Imam Hussein sat on the horse, he took some steps. As soon as he took steps, he heard a voice. What was the voice? The voice would say to him, Mahlan, Mahla, Yabna Zahra. Mahlan, Mahla, Yabna Zahra. 
Zahran or the son of Zahra. Who is it? It says she says it's me, your sister Zainab. What do you need? Ya Hussein, get off from the horse. She got off from the horse. She said to him, Hussein, give me your chest. She kissed the chest of her brother Hussein, saying, Oh mother of Fatima, this is the day you were speaking to me about. This is the day that you kept reminding me of. And indeed on the eve of the ninth, she went to her sons, On and Muhammad, and she said to them, Oh my beloveds, tomorrow Ali and Akbar is going to make his mother proud. Tomorrow Qasim is going to make his mother proud. Are you two going to make your mother proud? She said, he, they said to her, Oh mother, our grandfather is Amir al Mu'mineen, and our grandfather is Ja'far al Tayyar. Tomorrow we shall make you proud. Allahu Akbar. The next day they went to Aba Abdullah al Hussein. When Imam Hussein saw them, traditions say that when he glanced at them, he began to cry. He began to cry because they reminded him of his years of Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein when they were kids. When they had their father Amir al Mu'mineen, when they had their grandfather Rasulullah, when they had their mother Fatima. So he began to cry. And he said to them, return to your mother. Because after they kill me, after I no longer am available, then your mother will be all by herself. And your mother has seen enough tragedy. So they went back to their mother Zainab. And they said to, that, to, to her, that, I mean, that Imam Hussein says to us, we cannot fight. Sayyida Zainab took the hands of her children. Allahu Akbar. Imagine a mother dragging her own kids, bringing her own kids. She said to him, Hussein, Hussein, what am I supposed to answer my mother Fatima who will tell me you saw my beloved Hussein going towards our martyrdom but you did not send your sons before my son Hussein. What am I going to say to my mother? I'll say Layla gave her kids. I'll say the other mothers gave her kids but I did not offer my kids Ya Aba Abdullah. Allow my face to be clear and pure and to glow with my mother Fatima on the day of judgment. Imam Hussein gave those two brave men permission. They went to the battle. Allahu Akbar. They began to defend one another in the battle. And every while they would look back at their uncle Hussein. Every while they would look back at their uncle Abel Uncles, are you proud of us? Until they shouted out, Assalamu alayka ya amma. Imam Hussein went to them. He held them, he kissed them. And the first thing they asked was, Ya, ya amma, ya aba Abdullah, did we defend you right and are you proud of us? Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Sayyidi Ya Sahib al zaman Sayyidi Ya Sahib al zaman I'll tell you because I know your love for your aunt Zainab. On that day her heart was full of grief. But what about the day when she went back to Medina? She goes to the house of Hussein. The house of Hussein is empty. The house of Ali al Akbar is empty. She goes home and she sees the place of An and Muhammad empty. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Ya Zainab, ya Sayyidati wa Mawlati, salam Allah alayki wa ala sabruki wa ala istiqamatuki ya Sayyidati wa Mawlati. All of us all together. Now let us remind ourselves of that land where Imam Hussein fell as a martyr. If you can all together raise your voice, inshallah. 
for a few minutes, two minutes, and inshallah we will conclude the majlis. Karbala, oh Karbala. Those who have the love for Karbala, those who their hearts are departing towards Karbala altogether. Karbala, oh Karbala. Karbala, oh Karbala, oh my Shia, oh my Shia. Every time you drink water, remember me, and you hear of the martyr, do not forget me. Karbala. Oh, Karbala, Karbala, Karbala. Shiati mahma sharib tum ad bama in fadkuruni aw sama'atum bi shahidin aw qatilin fandubuni Karbala, oh Karbala Karbala